Chris, as always, it's a pleasure. Welcome. Thank you. And I guess I should just begin by saying congratulations to drugs for winning the war on drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, cannabis isn't really a drug, is it? I mean, it's an herb. No. It's a weed. It grows there. It grows out there in the fields uh, naturally, especially in places like Kentucky where they cannot eradicate it. And if you can't beat them, join them, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was just ill-conceived right from the get-go. And, and uh, the government, you know, it's turning out now that many, many more compounds, including mushrooms and ecstasy and other things, which the government has declared as Schedule One, like the worst of the worst, have, uh, of course, uh, uh, large medical benefits. And so you have to wonder, you know, what the government was really up to and what they what yeah. their motivations were and what they really cared about. And you don't have to dig far to find out it was money, money, power. money. DuPont doesn't like competition. Anyone uh, knows the story of DuPont? Just look it up uh, behind the nylon curtain, I think was the seminal, oh, yeah. seminal book on the DuPonts. Uh, the fa the fibers found in hemp, which was also banned and had no psychoactive properties or virtually none, uh, and in cannabis, were far superior to any artificial fiber that could come out of the uh, labs of DuPont in Delaware, a state they've owned almost since the beginning of the Revolutionary War, Chris. So... We got this prohibition, lies, we got that guy Henry Anslinger, we had the end of the war on alcohol, so we had all these thousands of revenuers, as they called them, and government agents, and they needed a job, and uh, what better way to, to give them a job than to make something else illegal that shouldn't have been? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just, uh, you know, you see that creeping regulation in all kinds of places, if you ever go down to your friendly local uh, firearms dealer and look at the regulations they have to put up with. It's astonishing. Uh, you know, they, yeah. they have to know thousands of pieces of individual code. You can't buy this one. Wait, this is pre ban It has to be not with this. Oh, we can't sell that unless it comes with it. It's just a, it's an amazing nightmare of regulations. Uh, and, and so when people say we need more gun laws, they really should go talk with somebody who runs one of these operations. We've got lots of laws. Oh. Um, and of course, you know, I think what we really need to be talking about is the fact that we live in, a, in an uncivil society that's highly violent to the rest of the world. And we're demanding that we live in peace and, and with no risk of, of any violence inside our borders. And that's just a ridiculous proposition. Uh, if you want to be a peaceful nation, you kind of have to be a peaceful nation. And we're not one. And yeah. and I, I don't know where you want to go with all this today, but I, I was just I'm a little outraged today by the apparent uh, massive amounts of concern over uh, this Khashoggi, the, the Washington Post uh, oh. journalist <clears throat> who was uh, killed gruesomely by Saudi Arabia and the Turkish consulate there. But uh, no outrage to be found about what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen, uh, mm -hmm. which is starving 13 million people right now and, uh, you know, uh, using U.S. weapons to destroy busloads of kids with regularity. No nothing, nothing to be found in the U.S. press about that. Uh, so just bizarre what I'm being asked to be outraged about on a daily basis doesn't line up with my own <laughs> internal barometer and, even slightly. And he was a uh, he was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. I think he was related to Adnan Khashoggi, who is a world class uh, weapons dealer. I actually had a couple of cases against him when I was a in my former life as an attorney. He owed like tens of millions of dollars. He had an uh, had a condo in the Trump Tower, or no, Olympic Towers, I take it back, because I had a friend, a client who was a neighbor of his, and then he went and died, so that was the end of that. Who knows how he went, but uh, the Khashoggi's are a uh, notorious family, and yet, oh, but he was a reporter, Chris. Hey, if you or I got bumped off, uh, we're theoretically journalists. Do you think they could care less? <laughs> I don't think they could care less. Yeah, we wouldn't even get a footnote. A, yeah, no, no. It, it's just it's just ridiculous what we're being, you know, what what we're told to uh, care about and what we're told not to care about. And then maybe that's not the ridiculous part. I get why they do that. I'm resistant to it. Mm. Um, but it annoys me how many people sort of pick up that banner and and run with it and yeah. and pretend as if that's the most important thing. Well, um, it's the meme generator. Right. It's the meme yeah. generator. Like every day there's a new meme that goes out to the mainstream media at 4 a.m. in the morning 
from their masters, whether it's in the intelligence committee, uh, intelligence community, or whatever group it is, they, their efforts are orchestrated and transparently so, because the language they always have a buzzword of the day, you know, sexual abuser Kavanaugh or whatever drunk. Uh, wild teenager Kavanaugh. There's always a buzzword. There's always something here, right? And mm -hmm. and you just have to like do a Google search of the term of the day, and you'll see it come up like 50 times, hundreds of times. Sometimes that's why you need to really uh, be aware that there's an agenda out there, and they're trying to tell you what to think. Well, there is. And I think one of the largest meme generators that runs on a daily basis is called the U.S. financial markets. And I have to use okay. double air quotes around that word yes. markets now because they're not markets anymore. Markets are where capital is allocated and price discovery happens. Mm -hmm. Neither of those things are occurring right now. Uh, I'm looking at the U.S. stock market as we're recording this. Uh, the S&P was down uh, 20 some points and it just nipple bottomed uh, I can't use a V bottom anymore. It just yeah. instantly decides to go the other way and it just mm -hmm. rockets the other direction. And of course, that's not how these things work. Yeah. Uh, somebody's in there mm -hmm. making sure that these markets are stabilized, going the direction. I'm sure they feel they're doing God's work and something very important, but also please to know that somehow they and all of their insider buddies get stinking rich uh, mm -hmm. over all of this on a very, very consistent basis. And and that's the game. But th that's always trotted out. Speaking of memes, right? It's, you know, the headlines, mm -hmm. markets were cheered by or whatever. I, I put up a, a tweet yesterday where I showed that every market in the world all went the same direction, tick by tick. You couldn't tell them apart. The German DAX, the Eurostox 50, the Nikkei, the NASDAQ, the S&P, they all were like identical. You could overlay them perfectly with each other. But the story they ran with was Morgan Stanley's earnings uh, cheered, you know, U.S. stocks. No, it wasn't U.S. stocks. It was global stocks. And by the way, the coordinated behavior began hours before the earnings were released. And this is the kind of stuff you'd notice if you're paying even the slightest bit of attention. But mm -hmm. to the average person, they just hear, wow, stocks were stabilized and they went up and maybe I should have should have bought something, right? Yeah, I should have bought something at the, you know, got to buy the dips, you know, you, you right. have to, you know, you got to be in it to win it or whatever these are, right? Um, that's but it's all lottery. just complete. Wait, that's the lottery. <laughs> that's the lottery. That's not supposed to be the stock market. You got to be in it to win it, right? If you don't, yep. if you don't play, they won't pay, right? Right. Well, I mean, let's just let, just to peel this back slightly. So Netflix up about 5% right now as we're talking. And the story is that they piled on 7 million more subscribers. That was beating the headline estimate of 6 million. Mm -hmm. So they must be doing great. But pay no attention to the fact they burned the most amount of money in any quarter of their entire existence. They are every new subscriber they sign up, they're losing money on according mm. to their business model. And they spent eight hundred and sixty nine million more this quarter than they than they took in in cash flow. They are just a money burning machine. Okay. So to everybody yeah. who's buying Netflix today on the basis of that headline, congratulations. Um, and you will lose money on that at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Unless unless your strategy is to sell it to a greater fool. But I'd like to remind people that's not a strategy. Uh, so at any rate, uh, good luck with that one. But it doesn't yeah. matter. We just got these dumb stories where it's 1999 again, Carrie. You remember yeah. eyeballs? Oh, how many eyeballs does Pets.com have? Like, well, how many subscribers does Netflix have? That's what's important. No, right. what's important is are they making money with their business model or not? That's, the that's what's important. <laughs> that's the McDonald's rationalization. We lose money on every burger, but we make up for it in volume. Look, if Netflix were to go to, <laughs> go to Shark Tank now, and, you know, Shark Tank, granted, is real reality TV, but it's more real than a lot of other shows for certain. You know, they would get laughed out of the place. So you got so much competition. Everybody's doing it. Oh, yeah, you're a leader, but but you're not making money, as Mr. Wonderful would say. And uh, how do you expect to continue this business on indefinitely? Oh, and do you have competitors? And what's the cost of entry and and uh, acquisition? You know, cost of acquisition of new customers. On and on and on. Yeah, he would rip them a new one. Yep. And, uh, and cost of retention. Yeah, and they'd go like, out. They'd go out with their uh, tail between their legs. There are so many streaming services here, Chris. I mean, look, I moved to a new place. We've got fiber to the door, 
And it's the coolest thing. I mean, I'm using AT&T U-verse, and all it is is a streaming service. It isn't cable TV like we know it. So that's another thing. Like, why is why are these companies like Comcast spending tens of billions of dollars to buy, you know, Disney or Fox Studios? This makes no sense whatsoever to me. I mean, I think I'm a practical person, but when I see this nonsense, I really got to shake my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The the there's so many streaming services out there and there's so much competition and there's so many different ways to slice this uh, that again, if this was on Shark Tank, you know, that would be one of the things they'd be yeah. looking at. It's like, well, yeah. you have a, a food delivery service using a web van. Okay. You know, what, what, what could possibly, what's your cost here? Uh, what, what are your expense profiles? What are the barriers to entry? You know, what's really going on here? And if you just took the Netflix would come through the door in this uh, Shark Tank and say, well, we've been in business a long time. Here's our financials. And mm -hmm. it's just been a sea of red ink yeah. from a cash flow basis. Like if they can't access the capital markets, they're out of business. All done. Yeah. And Tesla is a perfect example. Amazon has never really been super profitable. Their server business is where it's at. But outside of that, uh, the rest is marginally profitable, if that at best. And yet their stock has been so bid up that they can buy up any company they want. They just bought up that uh, company that was on Shark Tank, speaking of Shark Tank, and got turned down, Ring became a billion-dollar company. Amazon bought them out. And, you know, you, you see these irrational outcomes, these irrational situations in the market, and you just shake your head and think, are, are we the only sane ones left here, Chris? <laughs> uh, well, you know, this is sort of like late bubble dynamics and, and – uh, you know, it's just been going on far too long. What are we, 10 years into this insanity at this point in yeah. time? My view is that, look, even with all these market jams and, and we'll, get the, we'll get things green again and we'll do all this stuff, the big deal is that um, for the first time in, in a long time, we're going to see the major central banks actually uh, – go to a zero position in terms of what they're adding. Let's make no mistake, they're still adding on a net basis today, all the major central banks, but it's less than it was a few months ago. It's less than it was a year ago. It should be going to zero by the end of the year. Personal prediction, Kerry, I don't think they make it all the way to zero. I think these markets yeah. will fall apart well before then. I think that uh, it's not unlike those old Saturn V failed rocket launch things you used to see, right, uh -huh. where it's going up and it's slowing. Shouldn't that rocket be going faster? Yeah, and it right. sort of dozes over and crashes, right? That's what happens when you don't have enough thrust. I think we're already seeing this in terms of emerging market, um, you know, collapses in terms of currencies, bonds, stocks, all that other stuff, the, the rots coming towards the center. There's just an astonishing amount of things out there that these markets should be paying attention to. And I know they're manipulated and I know they, they dump money in like they do like they are today. But when you look at what's going on in Iran and their continued threats to maybe shut down the Strait or Hormuz, when you look at what's happening with Italy going into its big showdown with the Troika, that yeah. being the EU, the ECB and the IMF, um, that could end very badly for the European experiment. The China uh, tensions that are going on right now, they're getting really ripped at the United States and Trump's style and substance of what he's up to. It's just there's so many things you could point to to say this is not a bullish story. But yet somehow every single day when the markets go down, you find these massive buy orders just come out of nowhere. And I would love to know. What Bernanke's doing over there at Citadel, by the way, uh -huh. Citadel, for the people who don't know, it's that major high frequency trading company yeah. that's responsible for roughly 20 percent of all U.S. trading volume. What is Bernanke doing over there? You know, why did he get offered that plum position at a firm, which would be, by the way, the one I would choose to work with them and BlackRock? Um, mm -hmm. would be the ones I would choose if I was in the business of saying I need some private partnerships to help the government. Uh, have the markets go in the correct direction. Absolutely. Uh, so right about that. And, <laughs> you know, uh, they're also, Citadel's probably responsible for about 100% of the trades that never go through because they pull their bid when they, when the, the nanosecond it becomes unprofitable and then the trade doesn't happen even though the other party clicked, uh, clicked the button. 
you know, they're just yep. like, they should not be permitted to exist. But, uh, but our government, uh, you know, high frequency trading adds nothing in, to the fundamentals of the market. It only gives liquidity when you don't need it. And when you do need it most, the HFTs, as they're known, will disappear in a nanosecond. And then the market will be left to its own demise. We know this. We know it's coming. And they could very well wind up being the uh, the straw that breaks the uh, the market's uh, back. Well, it could. And, you know, the thing that I've been writing about more and more is just, so here's a, here's a data point um, on on that giant day of recovery uh, for the S&P, the Dow and the Nasdaq, all of that, um, mm. which uh, happened just this week. If you also looked at the U.S. dollar compared to the Japanese yen, it followed all of that tick for tick. I don't know who's controlling who, but here's the point. U.S. equity markets and the value of the Japanese yen against the dollar were. And my point here is that these are global markets now where the U.S. markets are tracking the German markets, which are tracking the Japanese yen and all of that. And so. I would think that that global concerns would somehow factor into these markets, which have been, of course, destroyed uh, in terms of price discovery capital allocation by these interventionist central banks. But here we are. We have these global markets. So what could derail them? Well, any sort of global tensions or breakdown in in global uh, flows of money and capital and things like that. Well, guess what? That's what's going on between the United States and China right now. Uh, we've got Russia back in a way, of course, from the U.S. dollar. You've got lots of, of uh, foreign countries looking to get away from uh, these global capital flows of the U.S. dollar. Plus, um, let's just talk about, you know, what you mentioned with those high frequency trading programs where they can just disappear at, you know, the click of a button, the blink of an eye. And um, so these feel like, you know, places where you would want a little risk off behavior, a little caution. And day after day, all that the authorities can think to do is to prop this, sell that, which generally translates into equities and bonds get a bid, gold gets sold. That's just how they've been operating for a long time. That's the world we live in. But it mm-hmm. it's, feels like it's drawn to a close here. Yeah, it definitely does have that feeling like uh, we're in the late innings of a ball game. <clears throat> the home team, the favorite. Uh, is behind and they have very little chance of of uh, getting back in the game and it's going to be over before you know it and unfortunately that's where we're heading here chris so hey peakprosperity.com best place to find you right uh, what else can you tell us well yeah just come on by we've got uh, a wonderful uh, website community lots of good data and a great subscription newsletter for people who like to go deeper this is a time where I think people really need to understand it is the late, late innings. So are you ready for that? Are you prepared? That's what we're talking about at Peak Prosperity. Yeah, have a plan in place because any plan, even a plan that's not good, is better than no plan at all. Because when you have no plan at all, then you are just uh, relying upon your instincts and your emotions, which can easily fail you or mislead you when you need them the most. That's why having a plan, because then you have a baseline and you can figure out your actions compared to the plan and what's actually unfolding. So important, Chris, you're doing a real service.